The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. This program was made possible through generous support of the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation to George Washington's Mount Vernon. Creating George Washington is a co-production of the Fairfax Network and George Washington's Mount Vernon. from many academic disciplines including music, history, language arts, science, math, and technology, Pulitzer Prize winner Roger Reynolds has created an exciting new orchestral work titled George Washington. His composition utilizes orchestra, multi-screen video, electronic sounds, and three narrators to explore the mind and personality of George Washington. In October of 2013, to celebrate the opening of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington, the National Symphony Orchestra performed the world premiere of Roger Reynolds' George Washington. In conjunction with the premiere, the Kennedy Center Education Department hosted a special event for D.C. area students. The event featured a question and answer session with the creative team behind George Washington is that however hard you study, however hard you work, however bright you are, however dedicated, you will never know everything you need to know when you want to act in this world. And the thing that you must do is to cultivate friendships and relationships with other people whose knowledge, whose ways, whose experience can help you as you help them. That's the message that comes out of this whole project from my point of view. Following the questions, the students attended a dress rehearsal performance by the National Symphony Orchestra. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. I have a very keen ear for um, when music is trying to touch your emotions, and his composition was really brilliant. I felt like I was in a book or actually during at the events that would happen. The conception of it arose out of uh, a combination of circumstances the coming together of interests on the part of the Mount Vernon Estate, the National Symphony, and the University of California. When the prospect of doing a work centered on George Washington, I had to admit to myself that I had no serious or nuanced impressions of the man. I didn't know really anything about him. He seemed an important icon, but not uh, you know, some kind of a living, breathing human being who said memorable things. So I decided that if I were going to do a work based on his life, I had to devise a text that used only his words. That was kind of a criterion that I set myself. And I w if I had been unable to make such a text, I wouldn't have gone ahead with the piece because somehow it seemed to me that he in this work had to speak, and he had to speak for himself. So the question was where to get the words. And I, I realized in the research that I did that he wrote very few speeches. There were, of course, a lot of diary entries and uh, many, many letters to people about whom he cared. And so I decided that the thing that I could seek was not a kind of history, a chronology, a narrative of the times, but rather of a window into his space, a window into his world. And that I would get that by the things that he said for himself, or that he said to people that mattered to him in his life. And when I started approaching it in that way, reading five or six biographies and so on, that keyed me to particular subjects, to particular letters, and then I worked with uh, a researcher at the Mount Vernon Estate, Mary Thompson, to refine my uh, searches uh, to make sure that I got everything. And uh, so I had then pages and pages of 
interesting ideas. And the question was how to orient them, how to organize them. And I realized that the, the life that Washington actually led, because of the turbulence of the times, was so chaotic. It wouldn't be possible to make a clear and relatively brief, let's say 20, 25 minute uh, picture that would be a coherent narrative. So I thought I would take a different approach and that there were aspects of his life which had to do with the origins of who he was. Then there was the primary period of, of engagement in a variety of different ways. And then there was the presidency and the brief aftermath and retirement. So I decided that the three major sections of the piece would be origins, engagement, and reflection. I think this gave me a broader um, insight of who he really was and just not what shows us in the books, but who he was as a person and not just the guy on the dollar bill. He was more than just a figure. He was, he was a man, you know, he was passionate about everything he believed in, whether it just be the hope of the American dream at the time or when he was combating the British during the Revolutionary War. He was just always so passionate about that. I think it's increasingly the case now that you can't really be a contemporary artist without being at some level engaged with technology. And if you are engaged with technology, you need expert advice, you need expert assistance. There's simply no way around it. What that means is that the range of your vision, where vision means imaginative projection, can uh, be much wider because you don't have to, at a certain moment, think, oh, I don't know how to do that. I'll find somebody who does know how to do that, and then I'll work with them. To assist with the realization of his vision, Professor Reynolds assembled a team of collaborators with very specific skills. Ross Carr is a New York-based musician and visual artist. Ross is responsible for developing the still and moving images which populate three screens that are on stage behind the orchestra. The three screens are going to be surrounding the orchestra and scaled up um, about 150% from what you see behind me. They're modeled on the interior of the octagonal cupola on top of Washington's mansion. But each of these projection screen panels create a 36 panel array that's like the window panes of Washington's cupola um, so that we can have discrete imagery on each of the three 12 panel screens, but also 36 discrete images in the immersive sort of projection environment. Jaime Oliver is a composer, an instrument builder, and a computer musician from Peru. Jaime's responsible for recording and processing sounds from Mount Vernon into the evocative landscape of sound imagery that accompanies the orchestra. I'm in charge of, the, of making the computer sounds. So the computer sounds were created with a series of algorithms we've worked together with Ro uh, Roger in the past and also with some new other ways of transforming sounds and creating uh, sound worlds. And they're all done by recording sounds at uh, George Washington's estate. Joseph Cusera is a sound and recording engineer with the University of California at San Diego. Joseph is in charge of all aspects of recording and disseminating the pre-recorded elements of George Washington. So I'm creating assets at the beginning and preparing them for the various individuals and then taking those, the assets that have been prepared by the other people in the team and manipulating them and um, creating the final mix for either a, a stereo mix to go with the video or a surround mix to go with the video or rehearsal tapes or live performance tapes. So I've, everything's been brightened here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's much better. And the texture, overlay texture, I've increased the contrast so you can see the paper texture and the on the right screen as well. With the actual projector, it'll work. And now the background is yeah, solid. Yeah, much better. Can the contrast be any higher there? Yeah. If things go well, they will understand my vision and I will give due respect to their ways of feeling and thinking. 
uh, when that kind of thing happens and you seed as an artist some of your own authority, you go places that you could not go yourself. And so do your collaborators. And that's what can be appealing. When his voice comes in, we should begin to have color. It okay. should be his warmth yep. and his age should be a little bit more palpable. Okay. Very often, egos get in the way of that. And they preclude. Like the, the what I see is real as collaboration. As and real collaboration are, involves wait, some level of accommodation. I still think there needs to be a leader. There still needs to be someone whose vision is guiding the whole. I know how to tell my collaborators when things aren't the way I want them and why they're not that way. So I work with a lot of young people and uh, these uh, relationships become sort of quasi-symbiotic. They have something I don't have, I have something they don't have and we trade off. I think two years ago, or maybe two and a half years ago, uh, Roger introduced me to this project concept, uh, this portrait of, of George Washington, um, and we were brainstorming about the idea of a multimedia collaboration, which would involve live electronic sounds um, diffused in the space with numerous speakers in the Kennedy Center, and also video projection design. And so he asked me to think about some ways in which imagery from George Washington's life and later we found Mount Vernon to be a, a, a site for shooting, how those images could be integrated into a symphonic performance um, by the National Symphony Orchestra on the Kennedy Center stage. So this is a bit early, this enters with the thunder sound. Let me slow it down a bit. Right. So this comes in. This would have been the lattice right now. now. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I've worked with people who actually are visual artists on their own. And I have to respect how they see their worlds. And in the case of Ross, for example, he's not at this point interested in computer transformations of images. He's interested in working cinematically. He's a brilliant uh, musician as a percussionist, uh, and he thinks in a way that a musician does, but he has the capacity to do that musical thinking with visual images. So he understood, as soon as I explained to him my concept of morphing images, that they shouldn't be stills, they should be tracking videos, made all the difference. So the brass and the, and the computer should be like a parrot. Yeah, 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 yes. Joseph Cusera, the recording engineer I've worked with for now maybe 30 years. And I've learned over time that his capacity to understand how to manage sound, recorded sound, disseminated sound, is way beyond anything that I could aspire to. And, I mean, he knows microphones, he knows loudspeakers, he knows digital mixers, he knows strategies for editing, which I understand, you know, in principle, but I could, it would be incredibly laborious to do. Joe handles the aspect of the design and the dissemination of a sound system. Ross worked with me to capture imagery to then montage it in relationship to this formative text. Jaime Oliver, who is a, a remarkable young composer and instrument builder and computer musician from Peru, uh, he was here as a graduate student and when this project came up I thought Jaime is the one that I want to work with. He spent a couple days capturing sounds from the, the Mount Vernon estate. Um, the sounds of wind and leaves and gravel and sounds that you'd hear as a tourist walking around, but close mic'd so that the detail is really present and then manipulated so that they come from all sides. So birds come from behind you and, and it really puts you in the environment of Mount Vernon. 
we recorded all these sounds from his house and decided to use those as the source material for the sound world we wanted to create. We recorded the mill, the grist mill that is really close by where he would have uh, milled his grains and we created cannons off of that to create the idea of war. So a lot of these sounds have that kind of strange integrity of being from his sound world and being transformed into these imaginary places where, where he would have been. And that has influenced a lot of the ways that I've designed the projections onto the three screens to make it an immersive experience. So the electronic sounds and the composed sounds from Roger Reynolds and the video are all mutually dependent and influential. The picture and the, the, the music and the, uh, the, compu the computer generated sounds were all, were all worked together perfectly. I think it really it works very well. As I was listening to them speak and watching the video, the music in the background was making me feel very emotional and how the piece worked beautifully together. While on a European vacation, Joseph Cusera was struck by the realization of how important the acoustic properties of a space were to the success of a musical composition. About 20 years ago, I went to Europe and went to the Köln Cathedral in Germany. And that was one of the cathedrals that Bach was a composer at. And I heard Bach's music in the room on the organ that he composed it. And I completely got it. I completely understood why the music was the way it was. And it's the composer playing on a specific instrument, writing music for a specific instrument, for a specific space. And that's exactly what we're doing. When uh, Professor Reynolds creates a work, we visit the space. He explains his concept to this group of, of um, technicians or fellow collaborators that work with him. And he chooses those collaborators for very specific reasons because we have the expertise that will assist him in realizing what he wants to accomplish. We try and analyze what all the problems might be, what all the attributes of this space are. And then we kind of make a list and figure out what it is we want to take advantage of in the space and what it is we need to mitigate or what the problems are that we're going to need to overcome. On a site visit to the Kennedy Center, Joseph made a very specialized recording. Um, they're called impulse responses and those sound files then go into this program and that becomes what's called an impulse response reverberator. We're using that technology to model this special concert hall. Even though they are working 3,000 miles from the performance location, the impulse response emulator makes this small rehearsal stage in San Diego sound like the enormous concert hall at the Kennedy Center. This allows the production team to hear their work as if they were sitting in the Kennedy Center audience. I prepared a fake orchestra so that the actors could rehearse with each other and uh, and Ross could know sort of how the music would unfold in, in, and, and work his video accordingly and I could work my own sounds with that too. So it was a very long process of creating the illusion that we were working with an orchestra. I think one thing we realized while working is that it's difficult to make speedy progress because each element is dependent on the other. So when we make a, uh, some progress in the synthesis of the audio, then I have to go through into the video and make uh, changes. And then we learn some new things from the video and then we have to make changes to the sound design. And this kind of incremental process is, it, the result is that it's a very tightly um, 
interactive experience, and I think it does create a synesthetic response, and, and it's, it's hard to detach the music from the visuals and vice versa. So at times I think the audience will feel like the music is, uh, on one level, a cinematic soundtrack, and then on the other level that the images are an environment in which these sounds exist. So it, it, it works in both directions, absolutely. It's changed so radically. Mm -hmm. And it's strange because I realized that uh, I realized that I was seeing a kind of pictorial surface before, and now I'm feeling a world of visual relationships. You That's know, good. It's really, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really amazing. Math and technology yeah. are critical to the creative process. When I studied in high school, and I was. Uh, learning about uh, sine waves and or just to know the, like, the trigonometrical property of what is a sine of an angle and uh, I really was not very interested <laughs> um, and now it's the first thing I teach when I teach how to make sound with a computer it is uh, at the center of a lot of of theories on how sound works and and it's a great element in making sounds with a computer. Uh, the same with matrices. I, th I never thought that they would be useful in my life. I thought why are they making me learn this thing? And uh, because I wanted to be a musician and I didn't really think that I would need this. And now actually a lot of the stuff that I learned in music has been less useful to me than the stuff that I use every day, which is based on math. If you at least have a very good understanding of math, that allows you to understand what's going on with acoustics, which is how sound moves within a space. It will give you a reasonable you know, stepping stone into computer programming, and since just about everything is computer driven now, if a computer doesn't do something that you want it to do, then there are lots of programs that are readily available um, that allow you to create your own program to do specifically what you want to do. The most important thing that I learned from music was the sensibility to listen and to pay attention and to be in the sound. But to make these sounds, you need to know what sound is and how to transform it and how to capture it and how to mold it like clay and transform it. And another really wonderful metaphor is how do you use these elements like in chemistry and make this new alloy, this new sound that is not any of the sounds that you hear in the orchestra or any of the sounds that you hear from natural sources. This is another w sound world and it, it has become more and more important for me to reflect on that relationship of how you make technology be musical. I do not subscribe to the idea that you're inspired or that, you know, some divine situation happens and, and then you're inspired and you write something. I do not uh, think that one works in the abstract, but rather than one that one develops the ability to find something that is interesting and explore. And it's in that process of exploration that you discover. And creativity is not creating something out of nothing. It's, it's more your ability to find something by transforming it, by looking at it in a different angle, from a different light. And those things are really the ones that matter a lot. The very beginning of this work begins with harpsichord music, which could actually have been heard by Washington in Mount Vernon. But then the computer begins to transform that sound to smear it out over time, to change its character without losing at another level its identity. These, these kinds of transformations of the imagined into the experienced 
That's something new. It can be a little more... The actor performances are rehearsed to the same level of artistic nuance as the other elements of the production. Yeah, so I'll start with the, the GW3. Yeah, I'll yeah, on not page on two. page two, right? Yeah. Okay. I retain an unalterable affection for you, which neither time nor distance can change. And neither time nor distance, distance can, can change. 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 It's okay. sort of like... Like a tam tam, <laughs> this is thing. So, I retain an unalterable affection for you, for you, for you, for you. right? You know? Which neither time nor distance can change. Yes, there you go. An unalterable affection for you. Yeah. Which neither time nor distance can change. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I think the, the initial impact of this piece is in the text that Roger has pulled from Washington's diary entries and letters. Um, so as, as I'm walking around the state, I sort of have the recitation of that sound in my head of, of his texts. And walking around the estate, you could see a tree, and it would have absolutely um, different meaning than just a tree on the historical landmark of Mount Vernon, but instead would also have this context of Washington's own text to, uh, to frame it. Um, so that changed my perspective of the, um, of, of, the, of the estate. And I think these images and that text for the audience at the Kennedy Center, it'll have the same sort of impact, that they'll, they'll see an image that is authentic. It's from the estate. It's from, a, from an artifact that Washington drew or, or wrote. Uh, and they'll hear his own text. And the goal of, of the combination of these elements is to cast a little bit more emotion and meaning onto um, what would otherwise be historical artifacts. It was crucial to us from the beginning that all the levels of this work, the ideas expressed, the voices heard, the orchestral music, the images moving, the computer transformations of natural sound and so on would all be interactive and at some kind of parody so that they never contradict each other, they never interfere with each other, they're always flowing in support of one another. So if you are at a performance of this work and you are thinking only of the sights or only of the words or only of the sounds, then you're missing something. Because the desire on my part is that this becomes a kind of amalgam, which pulls everything in our capacity to feel, to understand, to experience, and puts it all at the service of one multifaceted vision. I see their situation, know their danger, without having it in my power to give them further relief. intellectual light will spring up in the dark corners of the earth, that freedom of inquiry will produce liberality of conduct, that mankind will reverse the absurd position that the many were made for the few.